Yeah, Midian. Okay. And so he ended up there and uh and uh and uh I think he, he sort of he found the right well to hang out with because this man named Jethro, which I don't know if you knew this, he, he hit oil and he moved to Midian. I don't know. And so uh and he ended up in Midian. But Moses hung out at the right uh the right well because Jethro had uh Jethro had seven daughters. I mean, he picked the right well. And so he was hanging out there. And so he, he began a new life. He began a new life. He married one of Jethro's daughters, uh, became a sheep herder, became someone who, uh, you know, did really well in it and did really well what he was doing. He was a good farmer. He was a good herder. He was, he was good at it. And so he created a new life. And I was reading somewhere in a commentary where it said that Moses' time in, in Egypt was 40 years. And then this time that he was in Midian was 40 years leading up to the burning bush. Now all that time, we can always debate that, but, but I think that, that shows is that there was some time involved. And then I, and there's some time involved. And, and so we see that Moses, he, he was in, entrenched in this uh, Egyptian culture, in this Pharaoh culture. And then we see 40 years after knowing that his people were being oppressed, he spent more time just creating a life and he didn't just flee back and try to to save his people. So we see that something's going on. In the scripture, I want to read the beginning first three our first six verses of Exodus three. I want us to look at this. And this is this is leading up to the the burning bush. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see, his strange, and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer. God said, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing on is holy ground. Then He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Something that stood out when I read these six verses, after sort of just doing some things, I realized that, uh, that Moses had to go through a great transformation. A great transformation to get him to this point. A great transformation because he had he had been raised in this Pharaoh uh, Egyptian culture, you know. And we we read about that in history books, pyramids, and all that fancy stuff. He'd been raised worshiping these gods, all right. And then he he w- he was removed from that, and he landed at this well with Jethro, his father-in-law, who happened to be a priest, who began to teach him uh, these things, and so. You know, we see Moses is uh, transformed from his life. He went from having everything to becoming uh, a slave, becoming one who's exiled from this land. He went from he went from worshiping gods to then realizing that there is one God. Uh, Moshe went from the single life to Mary life. There were all these moments in Moses' life that it was just a transformation, a change that was occurring. And we see here that I think. In this verse, we recognize that Moses truly gets God. When verse 6, he says, God says to him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses doesn't just go ho-hum, but he he hides his face. He was afraid. He was afraid because God was looking at him and he didn't know if he could look back. Moses made that transformation of recognizing that God was in control. That God was this God overall. And so we see this happening. And this transformation that is going on. And then we see we see that there's this transformation that's also happening. Is that uh, there seems to be now Moses understanding and being ready to receive this call of purpose from God. And let's read on in this. And it states... Uh, in verse 7 it says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And don't you think, like Moses like, it's about time. I mean, these people, your people have been in bondage. And so, and he says, God, God knows what's going on in Egypt. He is not blind to that. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. 
So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, paradise, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people and the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So all of a sudden, Moses, walking along, he sees this burning bush, he goes to it, and he recognizes it, and that God is calling him. That God is calling him to a purpose. And, and calling him to a thing that is, is pretty great. And it's daunting to him. Because he had lived in Egypt. He knows what he would have to face if he went back there. He knows that it would be hard. It would be difficult. But I think it's interesting to hear Moses' response. Moses' response was, Alright, let's go. Okay, I'll be back. I'll go get my staff and we'll be good to go. Moses' response is anything but that. And if we look at that, if we go back to that verse, he just says, Who? no, one more. Yeah, there you go. Oh, no, one more. No, no, one more. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Travis. But Moses' response, what's his initial response? Who am I? Who am I? How many of us have ever said that to God? Who am I, God? Who am I to go over to that person? Who am I to do this? There's probably been plenty of times in our lives where... We have said something like that. I came across this uh, this list of a bunch of eyes that I thought was uh, sort of interesting on on Moses's response to to the to God. And uh, the first response we see in three eleven where it says, "Who am I? Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh?" And it's this sort of this sense of Moses having an ina- inadequacy, inadequacy of being that individual that God truly would want. And I think this is something that works on all of us. That is a, that keeps us from doing God's will. And so many things is that is that idea of self belittlement, of just not thinking that we are good enough, that we keep ourselves hidden, that we keep ourselves down, that we are our, our worst uh, critic, it's just that we're not good enough. And that's what Moses was doing here. I'm not good enough. Don't you remember I murdered that guy? Don't you remember I grew up and I didn't even worship you for a while, and I don't even know much about you. I don't. I'm not. Who am I? Who am I? I'm just a sheep herder. That's all I am. You know? But self-belittlement can tear us down. Self-belittlement, I believe, is something that, that Satan really uses to keep us from new, doing God's glory. Another eye is this, this ignorance that Moses has. In uh, chapter 4, verse 1, If I come to the people of Israel and they ask me, uh, this is Moses saying to God, What is his name? What should I say to them? He's just ignorant to the fact. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know. I mean, he doesn't, you know. Sometimes I think we think Moses knows everything. I mean, later we find out that Moses got the Ten Commandments. So, I mean, I mean, you know, the stuff that he was learning, you know. Moses was learning this stuff. He didn't know everything. I think a lot of times we just say, oh, I'm ignorant to the fact, so surely I can't be used. This purpose that God wants, He just doesn't want me to do it because I'm just ignorant to the fact. Uh, and then I, and this is interesting, incredible, incredible. The incredibility, uh, just not having the, the credibility that, that he thinks he needs to have. He says that in four one as well. But behold, they will not believe me. Moses is saying this. Or listen to my voice, that, for they will say, the Lord did not appear unto you. How many of you ever felt that? You know, like you have to have like a video, like a YouTube clip of God being like, well, Alex said that I'm I'm allowing Alex to say this in front of you. You know, we want that. We want to have that credibility in front of us. And Moses is saying, no. I don't have that, you know? I don't have that. Uh, and then what was the thing that we always talk about, like, with Moses? What was the thing that he always said that he couldn't do? What was the thing that kept him back, that his big excuse was? What was it? The speech. Yeah, the speech. His speech was that, right? He said, I'm not, I'm not inarticulate. I'm inarticulate. I can't talk in front of people. I'm not eloquent in my, in my words. And he said, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. I'm not inarticulate. You know, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't speak uh, well. 